Thanks everyone for being here. Um, it's great hearing all this research. My name is Elora Raymond. I'm an assistant professor in the School of City and Regional Planning uh, here at Georgia Tech. And I'm excited to talk to you today about uh, work that I've been doing on preventing post-disaster evictions. We've done a fair amount of research about this during the pandemic. And we've also looked at displacement and migration after other types of disasters like storms. So the project I wanna to present to you today is about evictions after hurricanes um, in four different states across the country. And the reason that we thought to do this study was in part because in working with uh, tenant groups and legal aid groups across the country, we realized that this was something that was bubbling up. People are talking about evictions after the disaster. The post-disaster recovery period is not one in which people are getting a lot of aid, but they're also um, losing their homes even if they didn't lose them through the storm. And we wanted to kind of do a peer-reviewed study and investigate what the causes might be and try and think more carefully about what the policy remedies might be. So it was part of the impetus for this study. So I give a lot of credit to my co-authors, especially uh, Tim Green at Clemson University and Molly Kaminsky, who's a student of ours from South Carolina, who had a lot of personal experience about this uh, after the 2015 Hurricane Joaquin. So we framed this study uh, with some work by Pace and Elliott on disasters and inequality. They think of places as recovery machines and they draw on Logan and Maloch's theory of the growth machine. And they move beyond kind of this idea of a city as a growth machine and highlight how power and vulnerability emerge after disaster strikes and long-term recovery begins. So we're really familiar with this idea of vulnerability and how a storm might impact communities differentially because maybe some people's houses are more strongly constructed than others. Maybe certain people live in flood zones. But what we're interested in is after the storm, the way recovery is implemented actually benefits some people and harms others. So we're interested in that inequality through disaster recovery processes. We looked into why landlords might file for eviction after a storm. Um, what's the connection there? Some of the thinking is that this has to do with physical damage, right? The landlord might say, well, the roof, re roof is leaking, but you still owe rent. And the tenant might say, look, I'm not paying for a place that has a leaky roof and an eviction is filed. So it might be that friction or that tension over the physical damage that happens after a storm. It might be because of the indirect economic impacts, right? So if tenants are working um, paycheck, paying rent, you know, living paycheck to paycheck, working an hourly job and they're missing some hours because of the storm, they might not be able to make rent. And that might be the reason why evictions arise. The other main conduit that we found was that often the recovery effort itself brings in relatively higher wage workers. I don't want to overestimate this, I have colleagues who look at migrant construction laborers um, and find that these are not terribly well-off people, right? They're also dealing with a lot of precarity, economic precarity, um, workplace dangers, stuff like that. So I don't want to overestimate how privileged these people are, but they might be able to pay a higher rent than the very low-income folks in that area during the recovery period. And so rents are rising specifically in that strata of housing that low-income, marginalized communities live, and that might be a cause of evictions through price increases. So these are just some of the reasons why we see the connection. We also looked at FEMA recovery processes. There are people in this room who are much better experts than me on FEMA. I'm primarily a housing gentrification type scholar. Um, but a lot of FEMA recovery programs are focused on property. They're focused on helping people who own buildings repair them. There's less aid for people who rent. Um, and so that might be generating some of the inequality here. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about um, eviction, the harms caused by eviction. There's a lot of research on how forced moves are really bad for people's health. They're extremely stressful. They're one of the top 10 most stressful events. Um, they can lead to a permanent loss of wealth as people leave expensive belongings behind or lose them through an eviction process. They can damage your credit record and make it really hard to rent again elsewhere. Um, and they're bad for children, right? The disruption to school, the stress, um, the loss of income, et cetera. 
So we wanted to know, could we substantiate these stories that we're hearing? Do disasters lead to rising eviction rates? And we wanted to understand this from a landlord-tenant law perspective. So we took a study that categorized each state based on whether its landlord-tenant law was business-oriented, protectionist towards tenants, or had a mix of the two, right? Protections for landlords, protections for tenants. And we tried to find every hurricane we could within the time frame where we had data to look at whether evictions rose in the year following. We ended up with four states, um, South Carolina, Alabama, Florida, and New Jersey. And <clears throat> what we found is that, I'm gonna go quickly, because I think I'm near time. Um, two minutes, okay. So what we found is that in a pro-business state, evictions rose by 33% in the year following the storm. And we're really comparing disaster-affected areas in that state to adjacent areas that didn't get the FEMA designation. So they rose 33% higher than the nearby county that didn't get affected by the storm. Uh, when we looked at states with a contradictory framework, we found, meaning they had tenant and business protections, we found that the evictions rose by between 42% uh, to, uh, between 16% to 42%, depending on which state you were in. And when we looked at the state that just had tenant protections, we found there's no change in evictions after the disaster. So that really showed us that the presence of landlord protections, regardless of whether there were also tenant protections, meant that tenants were not able to navigate that year after the disaster very well and avoid an eviction. And this makes sense when you look at the other research on legal culture nationwide. Um, when, so there's two studies, uh, one suggests that Courts culture is very important, like you can have the same set of laws, but depending on the legal culture in the state, that's gonna be interpreted and implemented very differently. So the presence of landlord protections might be a signal for the willingness of courts to let a tenant have their say when they um, do get evicted or the general proclivity of courts to, uh, you know, of evictions in that state. And then the other research that we saw finds that where tenant protections exist, in contradictory states, they're applied really unevenly. Um, so this study kind of like dovetails with those findings. Um, we had a lot of policy remedies that we suggested. I think evictions moratoria really makes sense, not just in the week after the storm, but maybe in the first months after the storm. Um, a lot of states already do um, rent control, right? Moratoria on rent increases for the disaster period, which makes sense. Um, tenant rental assistance with really reduced documentation, right? When you're fleeing from a disaster, is not a great time to provide eight forms of documentation. That makes it challenging. So thinking about how rental assistance can be delivered with the goal of helping people, not the goal of, you know, making sure every dot, I is dotted and T is crossed. Um, direct to tenant rental assistance, so making sure that aid flows not through some convoluted process before it gets to the tenant, but giving it directly to the tenant. Um, conditioning recovery funds to landlords. So if you get a lot of aid to your building to repair it, um, put a condition on that saying, you're not gonna file for eviction or you're gonna give 30 day notice periods or you're not gonna increase rents substantially. Um, just make sure that you're providing that disaster aid in a way that keeps community in place. Um, and then also targeting recovery funds towards those who need it most. So really pushing back on the kind of disproportionate way that aid is often allocated in the US context. So thanks very much. I really appreciate you guys listening and I'm looking forward to hearing everyone else's talk.